Welcome to Caregiving Club On Air. This podcast is dedicated to the millions of family caregivers who want wellness tips and self-care solutions, who seek expert advice, and who want news about healthy aging and how to create well home design in our forever homes. I'm Sherry Snelling, a corporate gerontologist, author, and educator, a TV interviewer, host, and news commentator. I'm joining you from Southern California, where our interviews and news take us all across the country to explore the many ways to help you on your caregiving journey and to lift you up here at Caregiving Club On Air. Welcome to Caregiving Club On Air. I'm your host, Sherry Snelling. And for this March episode, we have got a lot to share with you. First of all, Companies that Care Day is on March 21st, and we're going to be talking to Dr. Jennifer Olson, who is the CEO of the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregivers, and she's going to share some new insights from a report that RCI just put out based on its innovation lab, where it's looking at um, innovations in the workplace to support family caregivers. So stay tuned for that great interview coming up. And then in caregiver wellness news, we're going to focus on March 20th, which is International Happiness Day. And I'm going to take some insights from my new book, Me Time Monday, talk a little bit about what's the difference between happiness and joy. Uh, A lot of people ask that question, so we're going to answer that for you. Since it's also National Nutrition Month, we're going to touch upon some foods that actually help support better happiness and uh, better mood. And then on March 22nd, we're going to be celebrating World Water Day, and I'm going to focus on something that is some unknown, and that is how dehydrated Americans are. You're going to be really surprised by the statistics of how we're not getting enough water into our daily diet, and so what are the right measurements, what are the right things that we should be doing, and how does being dehydrated affect our brain health? And then for Wilhelm Design News, I'm going to turn to... Uh, a couple of different events and reports that have come out, one from the Global Wellness Institute on the 2024 trends uh, report that they just published. And then also I just got back from KBiz, which is the big, huge kitchen and bath industry show in Las Vegas. And I'm going to share with you some trends that help us for aging in place and well home design uh, and some other things there. And then finally, we'll wrap it all up with our Me Time Monday wellness hack. This one is going to be on how do we harness the four feel-good hormones for more happiness. So stay tuned for that at the end of our episode. And with that, let's dive into our caregiver wellness news. So for caregiver wellness news, we've got a lot to share with you. I'm going to try to keep it somewhat compact. Before we get to that great interview with Dr. Jennifer Olson of the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregivers, but we're going to start with March 20th, which is International Happiness Day. And, you know, there's so much science now and studies that have been done on happiness. Gallup uh, it puts out their annual report on global happiness uh, that they've tracked for years and years and years. Um, and I wanted to just talk a little bit about happiness and a, a lot of the insights that I found during the research for my book, Me Time Monday, The Weekly Wellness Plan to Find Balance and Joy for a Busy Life. So first of all, I write in the book that happiness is both a right, if you think about it, in the Declaration of Independence, we have the right to pursue life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So it's right there, uh, which was really uh aggressive and uh, innovative for its time. It was a new way of thinking of people that they actually had a right to happiness. But, you know, happiness is also a choice. Uh, Very often we think happiness is something that happens to us, but in fact, we are the architects of our own happiness. And so it's really important that we take that agency and we look for small ways to find happiness. Now, In the book, I talk a lot about what is really the difference between happiness and joy. And I wanted to just touch upon it quickly here, but I'm hopeful that maybe you'll buy the book if you're really interested and want to read more. But the real essence of happiness is happiness is about pleasure, right? It's about things that maybe bring a smile to our face. And that can be anything from 
we're getting married and just got engaged to we're eating a sprinkles cupcake to we just bought a new car or a new home. I mean, there are, there are kind of um, elements in our life that make us happy and they can be both things that are small or things that are, you know, quite life changing and quite big. But uh, what they're really kind of related to is something we call hedonistic happiness, which are things that uh, give us pleasure, but not necessarily give us meaning. Now, if you're getting engaged and getting married, of course, that has a lot of meaning to it. So maybe that wasn't the best example. But joy is something that brings meaning to your life. So it is happiness plus. Uh, It's happiness on steroids, right? And so joy are going to be those things that you will be able to keep in your memory bank and remember for for very long times and that you can pull out at any time during, you know, during challenging times, during down times, hard times, and think about that experience that brings, again, that smile to your face, fills your heart with a smile. And that's really joy. So joy is something we look for in terms of gerontology because that is going to be um, this power, if you will, that carries you through life. When you have joy in your life, you have meaning in your life. And meaning is something you've created for yourself. We all have to personalize it. I can't tell you what your meaning is. And similarly, you can't tell me, but we all, again, are the designers, the architects of joy. And joy is what we're looking for. So yes, we can be happy in the moment. And we can have those fun times, you know, or whatever, but joy is really what we're looking for. And typically what we find is that happiness is often related to things. Okay. The sprinkles cupcake that I mentioned, maybe the red Ferrari uh, that you just got, but joy is really related to relationships. And it's really about the people in our life, our social health that boosts our emotional health. And again, gives you more meaning in life. And it can be the people we love. It could be we're mentoring, we're volunteering, uh, you know, we're we're participating in community events or whatever it happens to be, but it has meaning. So anyway, that's just a quick little definition, but I wanted to bring that to you because a lot of people have asked me as I'm out on my book tour. Uh, I get a lot of questions about that because, of course, you know, joy is in the title of my book. And uh, and people do ask about those things. I'm also going to have a link to the Gallup information I mentioned earlier and the Oxford Happiness Survey, which is something you can take yourself. We'll have a link on the episode guide page. It's kind of interesting if you really want to dig into more of this happiness. Uh, you know, how happy are you? Where do you uh, line up in terms of other uh, people across the globe that are happy? We'll we'll have that survey for you online. Um, the thing is, you know, March is National Nutrition Month, and we know that there are certain foods that actually chemically interact with our brain and can actually boost our happiness. Now, um, back in season two, I want to do a shout out to our episode four from season two, Dr. Bonnie Kaplan, who I've talked about before. She wrote a book called The Better Brain, and it was how to overcome AD. HD and anxiety, how to combat stress and depression, and basically, uh, you know, how to use food to bring more happiness and balance into your life. It's a great book. We're going to have, again, we'll have the link to her book there, but um, it really talks about micronutrients and, again, chemically what's happening in the brain to boost, particularly that um, hormone um, of serotonin, which is our mood boost hormone. And very often, serotonin, serotonin is linked to things like um, vitamin D, which is the sunshine vitamin. So it's it's linked to sunshine and positivity and all that. Um, I also write in the book, I'm not going to you know dive into it here, but I write about the rainbow diet, which brings fun into your nutrition. And also the sunshine diet, which is really hearkening back to farmer's hours and um, the new trend really in intermittent fasting, where you're eating in a condensed amount of hours during the day. Um, and it really helps boost your metabolism. And typically our metabolism, by the way, is best in the late afternoon, right around dusk. And it's interesting. I, I, you know, there's a lot of science and research in my book. You can read about why, but that is the best time to eat your last meal because you're going to metabolize that meal better than you do other eating during the day. So I will leave you with that, but a couple other just shout outs I want to do here. Um, There is a lot going on in this whole movement called food as medicine. 
So there's an app out. It's a startup um, company, but it's called Food Smart. We're going to have a link to them. I thought this was really interesting because what it is, it's similar to telemedicine apps or teletherapy apps where you get access to a nutritionist who can help uh, create a personalized uh, nutrition plan for you. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, also, the Department of Health and Human Services, so part of the government, is now working with, if you can believe it, Instacart. Um, but it is looking at food for medicine. And there was a big summit that was in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago talking about how do we avoid these food deserts that we see in a lot of underserved communities? And how do we help reduce the rates of um, obesity, which then lead to chronic illnesses like diabetes and cancer and Alzheimer's and other things that we are trying to combat? Um, how do we do that and have better nutrition? And one of the ways is maybe to have a uh, facilitated you know, some of these delivery systems. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, right now, it's just kind of being talked about. Um, but you can look forward to the government now getting involved in the food for medicine movement. And then also Albertsons launched a Sincerely Health app which helps shoppers with wellness rewards, which is really interesting. So if you use their app and you buy foods that are on their list of wellness foods, then you get certain rewards that'll kind of encourage you to keep going and uh, maybe tap into some other wellness foods they have in the store. So kind of interesting, you know, good education for all of us, I think, as we're in the grocery store and shopping. Um, and then I also want to mention uh, March 22nd is World Water Day. Now, World Water Day is really focused around the lack of good drinking water in, again, a lot of um, more third world and underdeveloped countries. That's really what it was created for. But there's a lot of organizations now that are also using World Water Day to shine a light on how important water is to our health and wellness. And I wanted to share with you some of the research from my book just really quickly. So um, a study that was done last year, 2023, that was done over a 30-year period. So this is a longitudinal study. Those are usually some of the best studies out there, by the way, for research, because it really shows that Okay, over the course of many, many years, this one being 30 years, we have now established these patterns. We see, you know, these markers that are definitely leading us to these conclusions. Also, it was a very large cohort. That's another thing that we look for in research. It was 11,000 people that uh, were both uh, white Caucasians as well as African Americans, uh, black adults. And it showed that proper hydration can... Um, uh, or, I'm sorry, improper hydration can, or, okay, I'm going to get this right, I promise. Proper hydration, <laughs> getting enough water during the day, can slow cellular aging by 50%, which is pretty amazing. And it's, you know, but what it also showed is that, uh, I'm sorry, half of people in the study were not getting enough water to have this take effect. So in other words, you can slow down the aging process and um, now you're not going to be able to stay, you know, 25 forever, but you can slow it somewhat by being properly hydrated. And a lot of this also has to do with how our brain health interacts with it needs hydration. First of all, we need it for just the cartilage and the joints to keep them lubricated. You know, think of the Tin Man and Wizard of Oz, right? But also, it, you know, uh, it's helping to pump blood and the oxygen throughout our body and helping to repair the muscles and the cells as well as the working cells in our brain. So hydration is really, really important. And with half of Americans being dehydrated, this is not a good trend. So we want to make sure we're getting enough uh, water during the day. So with uh, if you're 1% dehydrated, you experience a 5% decline in cognitive function and even can have some short-term memory loss. That's just 1% of your hydration being lower than it should be. So what are the new things that we're looking at? Okay. The National Academy of Medicine said that women should be drinking 91 fluid ounces a day. Now, that's way up from the 64 ounces that we used to talk about. Remember, eight uh, glasses of eight ounces? That's 64. Now, they're saying 91. So you can see the gap on how we're not staying hydrated. And then men should consume 125 ounces. Now, that's a lot. And I know as we get older, we get really concerned about drinking too much water because we're going to make a lot more 
trips to the bathroom, maybe have a little bladder leak problem here and there. Um, so we avoid it, right? But we don't want to do that. What we want to do is we want to look for other alternatives that can help us uh, with, you know, hydration without losing you know, without saying, okay, I'm not going to drink that much water because I'm just too afraid that, you know, I'm going to pee my pants here. Uh, so there are, you know, some great um, uh, s- solutions for this. You know, there's so many wonderful now bladder control things on the market. Uh, a lot of people now are turning to even Botox to help with bladder control. I've, I, I have a couple friends, one who has uh, MS. And she doesn't have a lot of control over some of the body function, functions that we have because of her MS. And so she's taken to having Botox injections to help with that. So there are some things that you can talk to your doctor about that help with that. Um, now, I don't think that the 91 ounces and 125 ounces at the National Academy of Medicine is necessarily personalized. So let's personalize it for you. Here's my formula that I've talked to several experts and doctors about. And here's what they say. What you should do is take your body weight So let's just say you weigh 160 pounds, okay? You're a 160 pound woman. You turn that into ounces, okay? 160 ounces. You take half of that number, that's 80 ounces. That is the number of ounces you should be drinking on a daily basis. Now that's much more personalized to your body. Uh, Now you can get into things also like body type. You know, some people are bigger boned rather than smaller boned. So you can work with that number a little bit, Basically, it's a lot more personalized to you because we all know, listen, if you're really tall or if you happen to have a little bit more weight, you need a little bit more water to flush the toxins and things out of your body. So I like that formula a little bit better uh, because I think it does make it a little bit more uh, personalized for you. So I wanted to just share that. And then, of course, one of our uh, biggest things that's happening in March is March 21st is National Companies That Care Day. And we're very focused. I've done most of my work actually in the employer channel, working with employers uh, to educate employees around caregiving and aging. So I do a lot of educational webinars and workshops and it covers the gamut from you know, Alzheimer's and dementia caregiving, brain health, wellness, well home design, uh, senior driving, you know, how to choose the best senior living, all kinds of stuff that we do. Um, And of course, I also went back and got my master's certification at MIT Sloan School of Management in shaping the jobs of the future. And one of the things they talked about in uh, that uh, master's class was the social contract at work. So I write about this in my book, Me Time Monday. What is the new social contract at work for employers who are trying to employ some, entice employees back to the workplace? And we know caregiving now is affecting uh, multiple, gen- multiple generations in the workplace. In fact, 23 million Americans are working and caregiving at the same time for a loved one. We know that one in six employees are caring for an older loved one. Now, if you add children into that mix and you define caregiving as Uh, you know, children all the way through parents and grandparents that you're caring for, that's one in three employees are being impacted by caregiving. So caregiving is at the forefront now of what employers have to look at. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is Gallup also did a report on happiness in the workplace. And what they found is that um, only one in three employees are thriving at work, 62% report being indifferent, and 18% are miserable. Those are not good numbers, folks. You know, we got to look at this. And so workplace loneliness is something that's being talked about a lot by employers. And it's kind of exacerbated a bit by the flexibility of working from home and working remotely. We're not in the office now collaborating and socializing with our coworkers. So we feel maybe a little bit less supported. We don't have that person we can turn to or talk to or confide in or ask advice of or whatever. And this is creating this sense of loneliness in now our jobs. And only three in 10 employees reported having a best friend at work. Uh, We know social health is really important and it's certainly important for family caregivers to have outlets of support. So this is something I think that employers are going to be looking at and talking about, but a lot of the benefits and things that are needed in the workplace are really being looked at by a lot of great organizations. And I wrote an article on this for PBS Next Avenue. I'll have the link on the episode guide page. Um, But what's really great is um, we're going to talk to Jennifer Olson about this topic as well. Now, one other quick shout 
shout out People Magazine and Great Places to Work. Do the Companies That Care list every year and also Great Places to Work list. Now, the number one company on the Great Places to Work was Hilton, Hilton Hotels. One of the reasons is in 2022, they added this Care for All initiative, which is a lot of mental health, emotional health, and support in the workplace for their employees who are caregiving. And, you know, they have a lot of hourly employees and people who work in the hotels, and they've really focused on what benefits not that nine-to-five office worker so much as the people who are more hourly workers or shift workers. Um, And then, of course, People Magazine, Great Places to Work, do companies that care list. Number one on the list for this year is Cisco, and we'll have the rest of the list, but American Express, big shout-out, Edward Jones, um, Pricewaters. House Coopers, Target. Uh, so we'll have the top 10 list on our episode guide page, but shout out to all those companies because they are companies that care. And it's not just caring about the environment or climate change or the communities, but it's caring also about the life uh wellness and the balance that their employees have. So hopefully we'll see more and more of this going forward. Um, then as I mentioned, we're we're um I did that Avenue Next Avenue article. So Care.com did a 2024 future benefits report. Let me just give you some highlights from that wonderful report they put out every year. So last year when they did the survey, and they do it among HR directors, but also employees of different companies. Um, Last year's survey said that the senior care benefit that employees were looking for outpaced child care for the first time since they began doing the survey in 2020. That was last year. Now this year, what they're finding is that um, 50% of employers are saying that, yes, we need to have these, we need to prioritize senior care benefits in the workplace for our caregiving employees. Would they also found that one in five employees have left a job because their employer didn't provide family care benefits, and 21% would leave one employer for another if they had access to senior care support. Now, Harvard also did a follow-up study to its 2019 uh, The Caring Company report, which is really great. They did it last year, and they based it on data from Wealthy. Wealthy is a care concierge uh, service that uh, employers can tap into to help their employees navigate all the different uh, you know, organizations, services, things that are out there that can help them be uh, better caregivers. And what this Harvard School Business re- School report found is that if a uh, senior care benefit helps just five employees who are caregiving, helps them stay on the job so they don't leave work take a leave of absence to care for an older loved one, but saves the company over $200,000 in related costs of replacing that employee by having to recruit somebody new, but it also builds up the loyalty of its current workforce and maybe can even be an incentive to stay stay with your employer. So really interesting stuff there. Um, And then as I mentioned, uh, the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving came out with a report called Working While Caregiving, or I'm sorry, Working While Caring, it was based on the Innovation Lab pilot study they just did. And we've got Jen Carlson, the CEO of the Ro- Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. This is a big one. Uh, I'm so glad she had time to talk to us. And she's going to tell us a little bit about this report and also what they found with uh, their Innovation Lab and what works in the workplace for caregivers. Here's our interview with Dr. Jennifer Olson. So I am really thrilled to have our um, podcast guest on today, particularly since this is Please the Care Month that we're looking at. And that is Dr. Jennifer Olson of the uh, Rosalind mm-hmm. Carter Institute for Caregivers. She's the executive director, and they are doing such great work. She's going to tell us a little bit about that. And then we're going to focus on a report that the RCI just brought out about caregivers in the workplace. So, Jennifer, welcome to our Caregiving Club on Air podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, it's great to, to uh, have you on. And, uh, you know, our first guest, uh, our first question for all of our guests is, where are we talking to you from today? Uh, Plains, Georgia. Wonderful. Well, it's it's great to have you on. And as I mentioned, RCI has really been a, a thought leader and an organization that has done so much great work for caregivers. Just give us a quick overview of all the different things that RCI is doing to support family caregivers. 
Well, first, we're following on Mrs. Carter's long legacy of engaging federal policymakers to make big change for caregivers, because we know right now that caregivers' physical and mental health continues to struggle, and today's caregiver is tomorrow's patient. So we're working a hall with Congress and every agency we can in Washington uh, to make transformative change happen there. We're working with employers, which I'll talk to you about a little bit more, um, and other sectors like emergency managers to see more ways that caregivers can be supported. Um, what we realized is our goal is to think about ways to make caregiving not necessarily easy, but less hard. And that means working with non-traditional sectors in this space that caregivers are going to come into contact with. Uh, and then we're looking, lastly, at some research to change the language we use to talk about caregivers um, to move away from the diagnosis or condition category. Because what we're doing then is we're actually defining a caregiver by somebody else's diagnosis. And that isn't the best way to see a caregiver that's our work. Well, and I love that because so often we think about caregiving as being about the medical condition or, you know, the disease or the disability of the person we're caring for. We forget about all the psychosocial aspects of living, which is so critical, important. It's wonderful to have you focus on that. And before we dive into the report, I just want to make a note because you have a beautiful monarch butterfly in your background. For those of us who, or those listeners who may watch also on YouTube, just tell us what the significance is of the butterfly. Yeah, so um, for those who don't know, Mrs. Carter was all a passionate advocate uh, for saving the monarch. And I think just this past week was National Monarch Day. Uh, the monarchs are near extinction. And as she would have told anyone who would listen, the best thing you can do for monarchs is to plant native milkweed in your garden. So um, for all your listeners, wherever you are, that's one thing you can do today to help the monarch. Absolutely. Well, and again, uh, Mrs. Carter was just such a wonderful pioneer and champion and really identifying the needs of caregivers. And particularly, I think also that mental health aspect, the burnout, the emotional side of it. So let's dive into this report that you just published, which is about caregivers in the workplace. And um, it's actually called Working While Caregiving, Innovations and Interventions to Support Caregivers in the Workplace. We're going to have a link to it on our episode guide page. But tell us what were the big findings from that report? So this report for us really uh, is the result of working directly with five employers in the Detroit metro area whose employee base, and these are small and medium-sized organizations, and some nonprofits and some for-profits, whose employees can't work remotely and can't have flexibility in time. Because I think a lot of the caregiver work conversation is about flexibility, different hours, telework, uh, those kinds of things. You know, we work with a bakery chain. You have to bake bread at the bakery, and you have to do it in the morning. That doesn't mean... Uh, caregivers should be excluded from that type of work, um, but yet we don't have solutions. So we worked uh, directly with these five employers who, throughout the course of a year, tried different approaches. They experimented themselves with their own workforces. They uh, looked at things that, um, like, you know, could they change some of their um, benefits and put a lens on, like, will this work for all care types? You know, is this a child care exclusive benefit? Can we have it be an elder care benefit? What can we do to make those changes? What can we do to train our supervisors uh, to inform how they talk to caregivers? Uh, what can we do to work with our benefits companies? You know, when we put out an RFP for next year's benefits, how can they compete almost on what caregivers uh, need? So they tried different things. The report outlines what they were willing to, what they tried, what they contemplated, what they stopped doing. Um, and I think that's important because it's great to have kind of a theoretical list of like what it means to be a caregiver friendly workplace, um, but we need real experience. Um, and I'm so thrilled that these five employers were willing to be honest and open about their experience uh, and have kind of come forward with what they did. Uh, next, and one of the biggest learnings from this work was that employers um, have a lot of gaps in their understanding of things like Medicaid and Medicare. And that would make sense. Why would your employer, like HR executive, also be a Medicaid expert? Um, you know, why would they know that the reason your employees aren't using that home care voucher isn't because they don't want it, it's because there's no home care available? Like, these are the things um, that we 
really work with those employers to learn and get the understanding of um, and and get them uh, into a place of kind of what they need to explore next. Yeah, and I, I love the fact that you you really focused on that kind of non nine to five white collar <laughs> worker because we all know. I mean, it's near and dear to my heart. My family works in the food service industry. We have so many people out there that you know whether they're truck drivers or working in retail. I mean, you know, it's it's really hard when you're hourly or shift worker or whatever uh, to not only tap into the benefits that your employer might have, but then also to struggle with the balance of you know caring for your loved ones. So I love that you really. Took a took a focused look at that. Um, you know, one of the things that came out of the Harvard report that was done a few years ago, and I think they even did a, an update on it more recently, is that there still seems to be a gap between what employers feel employees need or what they should be offering versus what the employees really say would help them. What did you find in your uh, your research in this survey and, and report? I think, um, and this won't be a surprise to you, but it was a, a lot about like location and knowledge of the local like of services really matter. And so, while you know um, a big company can look at millions of uh, healthcare workers out there, healthcare workers, they can look at all these support services that these amazing organizations offer. The real challenge is what's available in the neighborhood where your employee works. Um, and that you have a great benefit structure, but it's those, like what happens outside of the doors of your um, organization are equally as important as what you can provide in-house in those doors in, inside that organization. And so um, I think that continues to be a place where there needs to be more education. Um, and, and, you know, I think that disconnect between employers can do more and um, employees need to speak up. Like these are kind of narratives that we've heard. Um, I think there's education on all sides that can definitely yeah, I think that education, and you mentioned the training too of supervisors, which I think is so critical because if you haven't been through caregiving, sometimes it's hard, right? To be sympathetic or empathetic. And, you know, just having that that knowledge base for managers and supervisors is really, really important. One of the other things that I saw in the report that I thought was really interesting and kind of different, but not for you because you focus so much on mental health issues is the need for maybe some psychotherapy or some cognitive behavioral training for the caregivers, maybe through an EAP or other benefits that already exist. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think this finding um, is not necessarily a surprise, like you said, to an organization like ours that comes from uh, Ms. Carter's passion in mental health um, and mental well-being. Um, but this idea that there are things that an employer could do that would be broadly great for your workforce that will benefit your caregivers, right? So stepping up your access to mental health services, um, peer support services, all those options would be beneficial across the board. And caregivers are really going to tap into those benefits and benefit from those. Um, and so back to this question of like, are you making it hard? Or are you making it like five extra steps? Because you know, what a caregiver doesn't have is time. Time to like, get, you know, get to the right phone number, wait for the appointment, get the, you know, paperwork in to the right thing. So what can you do to reduce all the barriers to those mental health services that you have available? Um, that's going to be a big way to um, support what's the number one thing that uh, employee caregivers talk about is that stress of trying to navigate the stressors of being a tool, like right, working a double or a triple in the case of some individuals. Um, so think about yeah. that. And I, and I think it's, you know, the difficulty that I've found in this caregiving, family caregiving ecosystem or space is that, you know, we don't know what we don't know. Sometimes we don't even know the questions to ask until we're knee deep, you know, in it. And then, of course, you know, it's overwhelming and you're juggling all these different balls. Um, hopefully some of the education that can be provided will get more people thinking about it even before, you know, they may step into a more active caregiving role. Um, but the other thing that you you talk about that the companies did, and it was part of your report that I thought was really fascinating, is you created what you call the Innovation Lab. Tell us about what that is. So I think uh, from these conversations with these employers and others, that there is a willingness 
to for employers to do more or find paths to doing more, not necessarily expensive solutions, but you know, finding solutions. And what they often don't have is the space to have those conversations with other employers, right? It's either a competitive mindset or um, talk to your own sector, but not your own local organization. And so this idea was, you know, that the nonprofit that provides social services in the community has a very similar problem that the manufacturer that's in that same place. But those two HR executives would never normally be in the same room because we artificially separate them. But yet they both have workforces that are on shift, have to be present, um, and they have limited budgets, right? They're medium-sized enterprises or small enterprises. Um, so giving, um, kind of creating that peer group that would not traditionally come together and kind of putting out the space of uh, saying, like, it's your time to, like, think and throw ideas out here that will not be, you know, you won't get a cost if you're not you know, into a conversation about cost. Uh, it isn't with your own organization, so you're in your own kind of trapping. Um, and that these employers have compared notes at each point, I think, was a big part of the process. One of my colleagues said um, what surprised them the most about this whole experience was how prepared and eager these um, executives came to each meeting. You know, you're like, oh, they say they're interested in caregivers, but how much are they really? Um, no, this uh, group is deeply committed um, and very engaged. Well, and I, I love that because, you know, up until I think now, I think really you're the first to kind of collectively bring companies together to tackle this problem that they're all facing, but we're all looking at it with only the prism of, you know, the, just just the, our own company or or whatever it is. I think it's really brilliant to have that collective that can really share best practices with, with each other and, you know, stay innovative and stay ahead of the game. Um you know, in terms of uh, the other thing that I thought was really interesting is, you know, a lot of the EAPs have been focused on things like weight management or smoking cessation, you know, those types of programs, which are great, but not necessarily navigating caregiving. So one of the other things I thought was really great is the talk of having someone or a service that can create like a care plan. So listen and take all of the notes on what your needs are. And then also guiding you a little bit through the care transitions, because as you and I both know, caregiving can start one way and then it takes on a lot of different phases and stages as you go through it, uh, where you have different needs, you know, sometimes the needs escalate or they're different or whatever. So talk a little bit about what do you see in terms of employers wanting to embrace having this this service that really is quite unique for them? I think what we have kind of had a number of conversations around is that there are kind of marketplace solutions coming to people through whether it's the EAP structure or kind of uh, care concierge organizations that have been working directly with employers. And again, this is where locality matters. The um, employees are struggling with kind of getting the local service that they need, right? Knowing the person at the area agency on aging who knows the right form to fill out to get Meals on Wheels to deliver to your mom is very specific um, to that service. And your employer uh, EAP, like 1-800 phone number, is not going to be able to get you to that. Um, but yet you need somebody who can both kind of look at, like, again, what do you have inside the doors of your organization? And what exists outside, and how can I get the best and most out of both to serve, to your point, where you are in your care experience, right? Like, uh, transitions are hard, and transitions can mean both, like, physical difference for uh, the person you're caring for is turning 65 and going on to Medicare and all the process and insurance cards changing. Well, as an employer, I might not think of that as an important point, but if I was working with my navigator and saying, I'm really nervous, 65th birthday is coming. What do I need to do? What do I need to do in like what what benefits exist here? What do I need to change with you know the again the meal on meal provider? What do I need to do there? That's going to be important. The peer support is important, um, but then a, a peer who is savvy to how to utilize all the services that exist um, in your community is invaluable. 
Yeah, I do. I do some work with employers and I love these um, employee resource groups, the ERGs, uh, particularly ones that are formed around caregiving, because I just feel like, you know, they're really empowering each other and they're able to bring back some some real, you know, good intuition into what's going on in the workplace rather than everybody filling out a survey. Uh, it feels like it's got a little bit more movement than that. Um, well, this has just been really wonderful for our podcast listeners who may be caregivers who are also juggling work. What would be your advice in terms of um, what they should be thinking about or doing in terms of how their employee can help them? I mean, I think that one of the biggest things is to try to find um, peers in your workplace that have utilized the experience. You know what? Uh, um, Former caregivers are an amazing asset, both to companies and employers and to your fellow employees. And I think there's an opportunity um, for people who are former caregivers to kind of raise their hand and say, I've been through this. Uh, let me show you what I tried and the forms I had to do and all that process. Um, but also for um, supervisors to kind of know who those people are and suggest and kind of encourage, like, you know, maybe I don't know this journey. As a supervisor, but I know somebody else on our team has been through this. Encourage them to talk, um, and I think that will facilitate some of the untangling from the mystery. Yeah, which is great. Well, it's just been great having you on the podcast today, and Jennifer, thanks again. And you know, as you know, as a huge fan of Mrs. Carter, and I think that you are just carrying on her legacy in such a wonderful way. And she's, she and her institute that she created through your leadership is still having a lot of impact and helping our caregivers. So thank you. So wasn't that a lot of really great information from Jennifer? Um, and it was really so nice of her to take time. She is so busy and doing so many things. <laughs> you know, the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving does research, does these pilot programs. They advocate for caregivers in Washington. They've got a lot going on. So I really, really appreciate and I'm grateful for her to spend time to tell us about what's happening with caregivers in the workplace. Now let's turn to Well Home Design News. And as I mentioned up front, um, there's been, you know, a lot of things going on in February and March. Uh, the uh, Global Wellness Institute uh, put out its 2024 trends report. And I want to share some insights from that report with you on things that are happening, particularly in longevity and aging uh, that also, of course, apply to uh, caregiver wellness. And then also the Kitchen and Bath Industry Show, which is the biggest show for what's going on, what's next in our home designs is really interesting. There's a lot of stuff going on there. But again, I'm pulling out the nuggets for you of what really relates to us as family caregivers. It helps us maybe with our own homes, but also with our older loved ones' homes. So let me just quickly, the Global Wellness Institute, I want to tell you about some of the wellness trends. Uh, one of the biggest, of course, is in blue wellness. I write about this in my book, Me Time Monday, and it's around cold plunges. Now, this is not something new you've probably been seeing a lot of this in the news we see all the celebrities now are doing their cold plunges uh you know you can do it on your own um or you can buy an actual cold plunge tub that are out there now but basically cold plunging is also called ice bathing or cold immersion therapy um and it's where the water temperature is below 59 degrees fahrenheit um, that's typically, you know, the, where they say the level is for doing this. Now, you know, people who do it swear by it and say they've experienced wide ranging health benefits, everything from reducing their anxiety, alleviating that joint and muscle pain, which a lot of athletes have been doing this for years, by the way, this is what they use to alleviate those types of pains and then also boost their energy and focus. So, um, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, there's a whole Facebook group for people who are over the age of 50. And um, I'm trying to remember, I wrote about them in my book. I think his tagline is uh, be bold, get cold, never grow old, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, but anyway, I wanted to also share those some caution for you. For those of you out there who uh, may have high blood pressure, may have some heart issues, the National Center for Cold Water Safety warns that what happens when you do this cold immersion therapy is the blood vessels are constricting 
to the sudden cooling, right, of your body. And what that can do is increase your heart rate and your blood pressure increases as well. So you want to be really careful. If you have those types of ailments or issues, you may, and you're over the age of 50, I would say maybe even over the age of 40, talk to your doctor first before you go try this new trend. You know, so often we see stuff on TikTok and you know, we hear about these things in the news and we think, oh, yeah, it's safe. It's cool. But we have to personalize everything. We have to think about what our own bodies are like, um, you know, how we react to things and what's going to be best for us. So I want to do that word of caution out there. Um, now, there's also some other things happening in global wellness, things like um, so halotherapy, which is um, salt uh, therapy, uh, hydrotherapy, which is what we were just talking about, water, so things like cold plunging, which is also now in the biohacking category, which is becoming very trendy. Um, ice and color are chirotherapy and chromotherapy, and I write about all of these in my book. So you can really dig into what these mean, how they help your health and wellness, how they do help with longevity. Again, we want to personalize things, but the chromotherapy I find really fascinating because that is using um, colors that actually help to address certain ailments, certain issues. And, you know, we're using colors. If you think about infrared lighting that can, you know, reduce things like aging of cells, uh, blue light therapy, purple light therapy, green light therapy that are the lasers that conduct surgery. Light, these colors have been around since the ancient Egyptians and ancient, you know, Indian cultures but they are in use today in new tech technologically advanced ways. Um, I know me and my friends are really into the multicolor therapy. The red light infrared therapy is a good one for, again, reducing cellular aging and, and certain inflammation. Uh, the blue therapy can do uh, also help reduce the inflammation. So there's uh, some things you may want to look into that are really interesting. Um, and again, none of this is really officially approved by the FDA. And I'm certain that there's a lot of uh, doctors out there who kind of look down their nose on some of these wellness practices, functional medicine doctors are a little bit more open because they look at holistic treatments and it isn't just about prescribing, you know, a new drug or a new prescription for you. It's looking holistically into things like acupuncture and some of these other wellness techniques that may or may not be helpful, but you know, a lot of the science is building up behind it. Um, just because it isn't officially approved by the FDA doesn't mean that it isn't helpful. But again, you just want to go in with a, a word of caution and also maybe talk to someone who is more of a functional medicine practitioner who can help you understand more of that balance for your health. Um, now, at the Kitchen and Bath Show, what, what I found really interesting is the number one thing that's happening, and it's also in the Global Wellness Report, is air care. We are really concerned now with our homes and how well we are you know, uh, pulling those toxins and pollutants out, uh, making sure that, you know, the air recycling is, is done well and all of that. Uh, also, if you live in places like I know out here in California, we talk a lot about when the forest fires happen, the air quality is so bad. So we have to, you know, we have to kind of pivot on that and figure out ways to get better air into the homes when those things happen. And I think the pandemic brought this all to the forefront, right? Because we were at home, we were starting to understand things like the toxins and things that could be um, you know, transferred and, and in the air and all that. You know, airborne illnesses are very different. There was a lot of, I won't get into it here because this is one of my little soapbox soapbox moments. Those that people who know me will know. Uh, there was a lot of talk about COVID being airborne. That The definition of an airborne illness is very different. Smallpox is airborne. Ebola is airborne. So we want to be careful when we say airborne disease uh, translated through air is different. So there, but the serious, serious airborne diseases are in the BSL five labs that, you know, are under lock and key, at least here in the U S thank goodness. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention because a lot of people talked about COVID being airborne and it really wasn't an airborne disease. It could be translated through, uh, droplets that you might sneeze or whatever, but it was very, very low and wouldn't be considered airborne. Uh, so that's just a little insight on that. Um, but what was, so air care. So there are a lot of people who are investing in these ionization based filtration systems, uh, that eliminate a lot of these airborne particles that are even too tiny 
uh, to see, but they're hazardous when inhaled. So all of the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems are really upping their game. Specialists now are actually coming in to help create and build. They're working with home builders to build these into the homes. I'm seeing really, really high-end homes, particularly here in California, multi-million dollar homes that are Air care is one of the number one things that the builders are looking at. So they're bringing in the experts to figure this out, build it into the actual home so you don't have a lot of ancillary systems, you know, that aren't architecturally or design-wise, you know, kind of aesthetically pleasing. Um, But one of the things I thought was really interesting that the Global Wellness Report indicated is that one of the number one things for home buyers now is the wellness amenities in the home, not necessarily the price or does it have, you know, an ensuite bathroom. All things are certainly important. Maybe that's because it's already on your checklist, but this was becoming the number one question for real estate agents and interior designers, wellness amenities in the home. It's a trend that is here and going to stay. Now, something else I saw at the show was steam ovens are starting to replace microwaves and even some traditional convection ovens. Now, I will say this. They're very expensive right now. So that's the downside of this. But, you know, steaming food actually preserves the minerals, minerals and vitamins and doesn't change the structure of the food when you're reheating it. Um, and so there's combinations now of micro microwaves that have steam ability, ovens, convection ovens that have steam ability. But again, it's a, it's a little on the high end right now. You know, let's wait until maybe the costs come down. But it is something I think that people are really into their wellness and particularly nutrition uh, are looking at. It also, by the way, this one upside is it cooks your food faster. So it's going to save you on your energy bill. But costly, they're a little hard to clean too. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that. And it's going to take up more space. But it's a trend that's coming. Water filters are back. Again, we don't want a lot of plastic bottles now. So everyone's putting in their water filters built into their faucets or however, uh, but those are becoming really big. The little coffee tea bars where you have your Insta Hot and it's in a certain part of the kitchen is becoming a new part of big design that's out there. And then also just all, I mentioned the chromotherapy, which is colors, you color lighting. So, you know, Kohler has been a huge leader in this. They have all kinds of colored lighting that helps with circadian rhythms. So when you go into your bathroom at night, it's not going to wake you up because it's got that orangey red amber light that we love for night. It's not the blue light. But when you get up in the morning, they're going to blast you with the blue light because it's like, okay, get up, got to be energized. So it's really using the color spectrum of chromotherapy that helps us with health and wellness and helps us with those circadian rhythms and things like that. Particularly as we age, we know we go to the bathroom maybe a little more frequently at night. So we need that kind of help. And then aromatherapy. And again, another shout out to Kohler, who's a big leader in this. They have something now that attaches to your um, faucet in your shower or on your bathroom. Bath. And it's uh, it's essential oils that give you, again, calming, energizing, uh, you know, using peppermint, using lavenders, using those essential oils. And it's called Sprig. And it's attachment that you actually put into your uh, faucet. And then the, you can change out the oils and all that. Again, a little word of caution on essential oils. You want to be a little careful if you've got allergies or asthma. Uh, or COPD, you want to be careful with some of these essential oils. They can be a little overwhelming. So you want to really learn properly how to use them. And even if they're good for you, sometimes the essential oils can be overwhelming. I have asthma and allergies and I got to be, I have to be really careful because it can really make me like, woo, okay, I got to be careful about it being a little too overwhelming in the home. Uh, and so I, I kind of uh, have had a caution on using some of those essential oils. But for those of you who uh, are, it's okay, it's, it's another great way to bring health and wellness into your bath experience. And then I want to just do another shout out on a podcast we did earlier. This was from season two uh, and it was episode two and it was with our friend, Matt Paxton, who is, uh, he is the PBS host of Legacy List. He's the master declutter wizard. And listen to that episode. It's so great. If you want to declutter your home, Matt is the guy who can give you all of the really great tips and, and techniques. And I talk about decluttering in my book, Me Time Monday, because it goes back to that ancient brain. 
when we lived out on the African savanna and we lived in wide open spaces where we could see things and we could see greenery. So, but we didn't see a lot of clutter. When you have a lot of clutter, all of a sudden you don't feel safe. You feel overwhelmed. You feel like things are caving in on you and you really start to become a little anxious. And so from an emotional and mental health perspective, decluttering becomes really key. There's also something that we're going to talk about in our April podcast. So I'm doing a little preview of a podcast coming up. We talked to Heather Nickerson, who is the co-founder of Artifacts. And Artifacts is something you're going to learn about. It's really great that will help you with decluttering as well. So you can look forward to that episode as well. So with that, let's go to our Me Time Monday wellness hack, which is how do you harness the four feel-good hormones for more happiness? Welcome to our Me Time Monday wellness hack. This episode, we focus on how to harness the four feel-good hormones that create more happiness in life. In my Me Time Monday book, I focus on four hormones which create a sense of feeling good that can lead to better happiness. I call them the four hormones against the apocalypse because when you feel stressed, depressed, angry, or out of gas, you can tap into these four hormones to rescue you. These four hormones are also neurotransmitters, carrying messages to and from the brain, a bit like your FedEx for your body, but also your air traffic control, as these neurotransmitters can reroute to help you out of a negative journey. The four feel-good hormones are oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, and endorphins. Let's take a look at each one of these. First of all, oxytocin is the hormone that we associate with love, trust, and bonding. Its main function is to facilitate childbirth, which is why low levels of oxytocin are related to postpartum depression. The way that you can boost your oxytocin is mostly through physical touch, things such as hugs, holding hands, or just looking into someone's eyes. What we want to do is we want to to do a digital detox and have more IRL, which is in real life associations, rather than just URL, where we're having relationships on social media or online. The other ways you can get oxytocin are through physical exercise, listening or singing music, and also dancing. The second hormone is serotonin. Serotonin is the hormone that regulates moods and reduces anxiety and helps with depression. It also plays a key role in sleep patterns and circadian rhythms, and it helps with appetite. The ways that you can boost your serotonin is with certain foods that contain vitamin D, as well as high fiber foods, also physical activity, and ultraviolet light therapy virtual sunshine which is like a light therapy lamp that is used to help people who have sad which is seasonal affective disorder also to treat sundowning for those who have alzheimer's the third hormone are endorphins and they are about pain relief they're the body's natural morphine they're also connected to euphoria such as being in love having sex or eating delicious food The way that you can boost your endorphins is both aerobic exercise, but also through meditation, through music and singing, through dancing, through laughing, and through holistic uh, practices such as acupuncture. And the fourth hormone is dopamine. Dopamine is our central command for the brain's reward center. It allows feelings of arousal and pleasure. Dopamine also enables us to learn by allowing us to focus and concentrate, and it controls motivation. Dopamine can also play a role in negative behaviors, such as addictions to alcohol, drugs, or gambling. And it is often associated with Parkinson's disease. When there's a degeneration of nerve cells in the part of the brain called the substantia nigra, which controls movement, These nerve cells die or become impaired, losing the ability to produce dopamine. The way that you can boost your dopamine is through meditation, through exercise, through activities like cooking, and also reducing saturated fat in your diet. 
including more micronutrients for better microbiome or good health. We hope you enjoyed this Me Time Monday Wellness Hack. Each episode of our Caregiving Club On Air podcast features a new Me Time Monday Wellness Hack. You can find these and more in my book, Me Time Monday, The Weekly Wellness Plan to Find Balance and Joy for a Busy Life, or visit MeTimeMonday.com or CaregivingClub.com. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Caregiving Club On Air. Please hit the subscribe button to listen to us on our newest channels, Amazon Music, SiriusXM, iHeartRadio, Pandora, as well as Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts, and other listening channels. Check out all the resources and article links on our episode guide page at caregivingclub.com. Just hit the podcast tab at the top, and you can email us with comments and questions at podcast at caregivingclub.com. Thank you again for listening. Take care and stay well.